Good morning, ECGC. What's up, everybody? I'm Indy, and I hope you enjoyed the conference. Yesterday, we had many, many, many hours of some interesting, interesting conversations and interesting presentations. Today, this morning, right now, uh, the subject is... Wait, I, I just lost what it is. What's happening? Where, where am I? Uh, we, well, here, I will, introduce, I will introduce them right here. I totally just, oh, Annette Stevanel Erickson and Tommy Pearson helping you navigate through the legal, through the legal mess of everything. <laughs> Here we go. Let's pop you up on seat. I will, I will, I will leave it to you and ha have a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we look forward to talking to you and to listening to you and to your questions afterwards. Uh, we are a law firm in Sweden with clients all over the world. We'll be talking about a lot of interesting stuff in a while. But first, we have a film we just made about our company, short film, and we really like it. And this is, this is the first time we show it publicly. So enjoy it. I am the founder of Lawyer.se. I have been working with video game law since the year 2000. Since then, a multitude of clients in the video game industry have hired us in order to seek business guidance and avoid legal traps. I have both a Swedish and an American law degree. Therefore, our law firm can help video game clients all over the world. I grew up here in Jämtland. Ever since I was a child, I knew that lawyer was to be my profession. I love the video game industry its progress and the fact that it's growing faster than ever. I think we might be the only law firm in the world that only specializes in video game law. I've been in this industry for so long, it's like I've seen it all, done it all, and been in all situations. And of course, that is an immense advantage for my clients. No matter where I am in the world, I'm always there for my clients. 24 7 365. And we deliver fast, often within 24 hours or less. Time is of the essence, and moving fast is a true advantage for our clients. Try to call me on Christmas Eve, and I will answer. Legal work is important. Anything could happen out there, and it is essential to build a solid legal ground for the video game developers. We are there for them. Protecting them is our mission. Lawyer.se Protecting you 24-7-365 I, I really want to break in for a second and say that was cool! That was a great <laughs> running in the snow to the helicopter, bam, on the phone out in the snow. That was awesome. Anyway, I just wanted to break in there. That was a good job. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, yes, we made this film about ourselves and it, it shows a bit how we think and how we are. We're not the stiff kind of lawyers. We are there for everybody and we, we're kind of ourselves. We want to have fun also. So we, we're going to have a presentation now for you that will show, give you some, some different information and also um, teach you something maybe. Um, so let's start with the presentation. Wow. Yeah, you are going to have to pull it up on your screen there. Mm. Right now you have the, the stream pulled up on your screen. Great ad, I'm sold, says Tommy G, right there. Okay, yeah. presentation, here you go. Right. Good morning. This is full screen. This one. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Well, so while we while we have tech issues and you can't figure it out, it's pretty close there. Oh, you got it figured out. I was just going to ask you some questions. Like, is that your helicopter? Because that's cool. 
I, I really think this is yes. All right, there we go. We do have it figured out. Is the logo there now? Yes, it is. Here we go. <laughs> Great. This is uh, Laurie.se. It's our company. It's a very good website name as well. So I, I'm so glad we got it. www.lawyer.se is really fabulous. How, how did you get that? Uh, well, when uh, the Swedish uh, uh, authority for uh, uh, websites opened up 20 years ago, I applied and pretty much the first day and got it. So sometimes it can be fast. Yeah, it was really lucky. So you, you founded a company. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I ended up in the video industry 22 years ago and, and uh, figured out why not run your own company while doing it. It's easier to handle clients that way. Yeah. So let's go on. Why should you use a video game lawyer? Why do you need to have a lawyer in your firm when you're a video game developer? That is what we are going to talk about. So, one, what do you want? We maybe want somebody to protect your rights and not to make you lose money. So that's what we are here for, to help you with. This is me. I am the president of the company. Uh, I'm the CEO. Uh, I started as a business developer here and then I, I took care of growing the company. Uh, the law firm has been growing immensely and we have a lot of clients all over the world at the moment. Um, I think we're pretty, we're pretty we, th there aren't so many law firms that are specialized in video game law. So we, uh, we, we are quite, one, quite a rare type of company. <laughs> and this is you. This is me, Tommy Person here, and Tommy Person Esquire, to say in the States. Uh, uh, and I got a Swedish law degree from the University of Uppsala, top 25 in Europe. I got a Master of Laws from American University, uh, Washington College of Law, Washington DC, the top five uh, program in the States. And I got my bar exam from New York. And all this in the 90s, so I've been around for a while. And, and, and so, so, and I started my firm, like Annette said, 22 years ago, and mm. been in this industry Ever since 24 7, 365. Yeah, yeah. always. Always answering the phone. And you even live American time, though we live in Sweden. Yeah, I mean, I live in a, in a, in a, in a small uh, apartment up in a ski resort in northern Sweden. And in, in our industry, you know, normally negotiate with American publishers. So I live in American time. Yeah, time zone. waking up in the afternoon here and, and staying up all night. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lifestyle. Uh, we have plenty of clients for the moment. There, there are 130 regular clients, and this is just to mention a few. And they are spread out all over the world. We have the, most of them are in Scandinavia, um, Sweden, of course, but also we have a handful of clients in in the US, and we have from South Africa. We have uh, everywhere in Europe, in different places. So uh, the firm is growing. Um, mostly because of recommendations. So people, we every month we have some new clients, but all of them are within the field of video game. So today we'll also, this will be interesting. You'll have some advice about what you can do yourself regarding legal matters and what you shouldn't do and what can happen if you do the wrong thing. I think that's really good to hear about. So the question is, what what is lawyer doing, Tommy? Yeah, so we are specialized in the field of video game law. So first of all, we do give legal advice to our clients regarding anything matters in the video game industry regarding copyrights, ownership, uh, uh, contract issues, liabilities, uh, 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 warranties, and so on. And I say our bread and butter is contract negotiations we do uh, contracts every day every week every month every year uh, 10 15 20 a, a week sometimes anywhere from from the triple a contracts for triple a games 
uh, whereby you have maybe a budget around 100 to 120 million US for a game, and that can take anywhere from six to 12 months from first negotiation to have a, a signed contract with a major league publisher. Uh, in you know the big ones like Electric Arts or Microsoft or 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 Ubisoft and so on, right? And and also we do other co we do contracts with uh, with uh, IP licenses. I mean, right now I'm doing a deal here with a, a studio, a client, going to do a video game based on a on, on a famous uh, uh, cartoon. So we're negotiating the rights to make the game on the cartoon. And then we negotiate with the rights holder to the cartoon, the author of the cartoon, uh, 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 of, the, of the background, of the, of the ownership of the cartoon. As well, we negotiate sometimes with musicians or composers to get the, the, the correct uh, uh, rights to have the music in the game, sometimes by famous composers, sometimes by garage bands, can be anything like that. We do contract negotiation with, uh, with consultants, like contractors, make sure that all the work you do is owned by, by the studio or have a right to use it. And there's some ancillary rights, sometimes be, being what can you, I mean, it's a right to sell t-shirts or toys or soundtracks. I mean, we did a deal close to two weeks ago, we did a, quite a long negotiation with a famous composer regarding right to have soundtracks uh, based on his score also. There's a lot of things to handle. And their ownerships, and their, if you're a if you're developer, if you do a work for hire for a publisher, do you get the right to do a sequel as well, and so on? So we then make make sure we are pretty basically we're a full um, service law firm which can cover all the issues for in the industry for our our clients from from trademarks, mm. uh, uh, employment agreements, uh, uh, equity deals. Some, some clients get funded by. Investors some get purchased by by major uh, major studios as well, so we do all that. So why would you need external help? That's quite easy to understand. If you consider that you, it's always good to use somebody that knows what they're doing to use a specialist. So we are the specialists that that um, video game studios need to have the solid ground for the company. Um, I, I can say also about the company is something that we, we try also to help young, young, young people that just started the company that have, don't have so strong finance yet. We, we try to help them and, and help them for free or for a very, uh, very good price to, to start because this is so important. We really we don't want to see anybody uh, doing such a, a big job with with a with a video with, with a game and then it falls apart because just the ground wasn't solid. So this is the solid ground that that you really need. Um, Yeah, so we've been doing this. I mean, also to say here, we're right now six people in a law firm with three full-time attorneys and a CEO and a marketing uh, 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 executive and also have some, a person doing, doing doing back office. So we're three attorneys working here doing that and we're still growing and so on. And, and I think in many ways, like I said in, in the film here, we or I have basically seen it all and done it all. And there's a lot of things that happen here uh, in this industry, in my 22 years, and it's a kind of young industry. I mean, maybe been professional for maybe 30, 35 years tops, and it's based on some contracts, based on film and contracts, and so on. So, so it's, it's, it's new, it's fast moving, it's fast changing. So, first of all, if you have an legal issue with negotiating a contract, uh, first of all, you bring an, an, an attorney, but also bring in the right attorney. This story happened to to a friend of mine before I got to know him, so, uh, and whereby he had uh, a, 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 an idea for a, a game uh, based on the music of a famous pop group. So so he talked to he contacted the, the the record label, got the record label to sign off on doing a game based on the music of the rock, of the pop group. And they had a two-year plan for production, and halfway through the one year, <coughs> the, the record label changes their, their CEO. 
So a new CEO comes in and he doesn't want to continue with the music, uh, with the game project on 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 based on the, on the pop group's music, and, and again kind of a hassle. They have a contract; it's not that good. And and, and, and uh, my friend then contacted the local uh, chamber of commerce in this town we lived and said, "I need some help with attorney. Have a problem with with this with this music uh, record label regarding a video game." He said. Well, we have a board member. You're in luck. Our board member is a great attorney. Call him. He will help you. And they called the attorney, and he had, then would start negotiating, and nothing happened at all. And after three months, he had to let the attorney go because things went backwards. And then he found out that the attorney that was recommended by the by the chambers of commerce was an expert in real estate. If you want to build condominiums, it's the best apartment. It's the best attorney in the world for you, probably, but maybe not for negotiating video game contracts. Mm. So that's one one story to, to one issue to to remember, right? Mm. And, and and when we're in the video game industry, there's so many issues happening so rapidly. So you need to always be aware of what's happening around you. I have an, an issue right now here where a client, before it became a client, did a game and they looked into a a successful very very field of video games for mobile. We figure out we can do a game in this genre and do well. We a good studio, and good programmers, do great graphics. So let's make a game in this genre, and we kind of be inspired by some other games, and so on. But he didn't really realize it was the line between copying and being inspired by. So they did this game here, put it, and they got a good game self-published on Apple App Store, Google Play, and the game did really well for three weeks. And then they get a takedown notice, whereby another studio says, your game is infringing our game, and, and so on. And then it came to me here, what can we do here? And the thing is, when you've done your game, haven't done your homework, and you have copied maybe some look and feel, look, look, look and feel, or maybe some, 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 some statistics, how you get your extra currency, and so on, you're infringing. So they had to take the game down here, and now they're rebuilding it. It take them probably two months, and two months with no income, a lot of time to rebuild the game, and have a, 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 another studio who's looking after them. That's like, well, if you get too close, you're going to make another take down notice. So that's one horror story to make sure that make sure you don't infringe and copy someone else's game, right? And then there are always other issues. Another way around, I had a client here, who six months ago published a, a game on Steam and did really, really well. Then after like maybe a month, it's a game called the same name and the sequel, number two. Mm. So some studio in China did just make a, a quick and dirty game, pretty much stealing the, the look and feel from my client's game, from the studio's game, and took the same title and put number two on it. And someone got it in my client saying, did you make a sequel? It looks horrible, but it's selling really well. So then it was my job to look into this here and see if someone's using your name and your content without permission, where to contact Steam, to have them take down that game and so on. So that can happen. That's some story that happen as well. One thing here happened, I mean, also you gotta be careful when you try to do things yourself. I had a client, a studio that came to came to, come to, came to us about three years ago, said, we think we might need another terms of use for our game. We did one ourselves here, but we have a kind of problem with her. And I looked through it and said, where do you get this? We just copied it online. Have you read this section here, in section whatever, 32? It says, law and venue, Russian law, and any, any, any conflicts can handled by Russian courts. Hmm. I mean, that's not good you know, unless you're Russian, right? <laughs> so th that's one thing that happens, a horror story as well. Uh, um, and that issue I have right now is where, is where a, a, a video game studio here is going to have a game to be released. And to, to market the game, they contacted some influencers to market the game on Twitch and YouTube and so on. And then last week we got the the the, the first uh, view of one of the influencers uh, video, like a fifteen minute video to promote our game here. 
And what you see when you open up that video is a bunch of, uh, of clips or, 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 or material from famous films. So he had himself talking, he has some clips from, from, the, from the game, and, and, and some clips from, from, from the film. And you, you cannot use a famous film without permission to, to, to promote your own game. That's infringement. And so, so those issues we have. Mm, yeah. Anything can happen. This is also a very interesting, Tommy. Yes, yeah, so what you can do yourself, I mean, without an attorney, is when you make a video game from, from start, from scratch, from the first concept, concept art, uh, programming, uh, 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 and doing, doing, doing graphics and level design, make sure you do not infringe anyone else's game. You can be inspired by another, another studio's game or content or music or look and feel. You can have the kind of make your maybe your 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 characters look kind of like famous people, but not exactly. And and one one uh, one rule that one client of mine came up with a long time ago, now being copied quite a bit, is called the the seven change rule. When you make a video game, it'd be or or a character or an object. And you start with maybe with a picture of a famous person or a picture of of a car makes eight distinct changes to, to, the, to the object or the character to, for, 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 for a, a face. Maybe change maybe nose, eyes, uh, mouth, maybe maybe change the uh, facial hair, maybe the hair color, whatever, right? If I have a car, change the, 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 the headlights, the front, and so on, right? And also when, when you have, when you're working with, with maybe with your friends helping you out, or maybe, maybe, have contractors or maybe have employees, make sure you get all your stuff together. So make sure you have some, some paperwork that says that what they do is going to be owned by you. There'll be no, no issue regarding who owns what and so on. Mm. That's important. And, and so on. So I mean, make sure you, 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 when you make a game, make sure who will be working on the game. Do they have the right to work on the game? It might be someone, a friend of yours, maybe working for a, for a developer, we have a contract saying that's an employee. You know, and, and you're not allowed to work on anything else, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. and, and make sure if you have, if you're using uh, licenses, make sure you have a professional license for a game engine or a tool, whatever. I mean, if you have a student license, I mean, that, that one you can use as a student in, in, in your education, but you cannot publish a game based on a student license for, for, for a game engine or a tool. And so on. That's one the thing to, to think about. So make sure you, whenever you have have a tool somewhere or a game engine, even though it's difficult, read through the terms, the contract term for the right of use of the tool or the, or the game engine, or so on. And when you're working with friends, don't do a handshake. Put anything. Put something in a paper somewhere that, that you that who, who they are, or they an, an individual or a company, and, and what they're going to do for you. You gonna get paid or not? And, and then you have to sign it, so you own the rights and so on. So I mean, those little things make a lot of difference because in the beginning, when there's no money at stake, people are going to get along pretty good. But if your game <coughs> does well, and there's, there's a revenue stream somewhere, a lot of money, then people might get greedy and want to get part of, of, your, of your cake and piece of cake and get some revenue or revenue share or whatever. If you don't have contracts from the beginning or good understandings, it might go after you. Yeah, yeah. Just pause this. We're not going to talk about negotiations today. So we'll we'd like to have ourselves in the picture now. Nicely done. It's one of those things that we always push people to do is make sure that even if it is a bunch of friends getting together and making a game somewhere, you have something on paper that's, you know, making sure that everybody's covered. Um, all right. So we've got a few. Here's one that's been coming up a lot frequently. Do you think loot boxes constitute as gambling or need to be regulated? Just the, the classic uh, legal answer. It depends. So, so, That's the business answer too. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and so on. So I mean, right, right now, 
some, some countries like Holland and Belgium, they have some some regul- some laws regarding this, and some I think some states, maybe Washington State, is maybe supposed to have something coming on pretty soon. But right now, otherwise, it's it is kind of regulated by by the industries internally. So, so, so we have a, we have a association for game developers in Sweden, you have something in Europe, you also something in the US, looking into this. So right now, I think the regulations you have to show the odds. If you're buying and I am buying or whatever loot box, what's the odds of winning a certain item or certain uh, 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 currencies or maybe certain certain in-game currency or certain in-game asset or so on? So be careful if you're going to do a game with loot boxes right now. I think look into it and you show to tell the people the odds, whatever, and be aware it might be loss coming very soon. So be careful. And for better or worse, this industry does have a history of trying to police itself. That's how we ended up with ESRB and PEGI and, you know, all of these rating systems anyway. So the governments didn't step in on what was considered an R game, whatever, 20, 25 years ago. So next question, as an aspiring indie developer, what steps do you need to take in order to ensure that a game you came up with on your own, not licensed or based on something else, is owned by you and no one else can use it or accuse you of not having created it. Essentially, how do you register and maintain ownership of all the elements? Yeah, we can make those small steps. First, like I said, when you're doing development, make sure that you're not copying uh, in infringing somewhere. If you make sure you make those eight, eight significant changes to objects or characters and make sure your script is pretty unique. And and, me, and, and this is hard to, 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 to Really know what you do. You're gonna be aware of your maybe the genre was out there. Is there anything named out there? And what you can do is register for a trademark on the name of the game, and that you can, can protect. You can, you can search the trade registers if the game is the name is taken. So the name you can register, uh, and, and then when you have employees or consultants, you have in their contracts that they have to make sure. They guarantee you that, that what they've done is unique, original, and not infringing. And, and yourself, you need to, you mean, uh, you have those check all the boxes, make sure it's not close to or, or resemble other games and so on. And I mean, it's almost hard to know what's out there, right? So, I mean, you got to be, 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 be very, very aware and astute and, and, and try to make sure you, you, you know, kind of make, make sure you build from the ground up. Don't take any shortcuts. Don't use any placement uh, uh, arts or assets or whatever. But if you do, take them away before publishing, right? And, 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 and But I think both times, if you are new in the industry, try to find some more experienced person, maybe as an advisor, maybe some, some advising board or whatever you can talk and sound off with. They may get advice you from their experiences. Or you can talk to me about turn in the beginning, maybe an hour or two, say, look, we have this idea, that idea, do you think it will fly or not? And so on. And read all the, the, the online magazines and articles, whatever, so make sure what's happening out there. I mean, right, and you probably know, sometimes it's kind of gray zone, right? And where Lindsay Lohan did sue GTR 5, there's some, so Blonde girl in a bikini, pretty stupid, and she said, "This is me copying my look and feel and my personality." But she lost that case, right? And sometimes, if a game is successful, you might get sued because people trying to get some of your money, right? So, one issue like last year, one of an, an American, African American football player, uh, formerly, who looks into every game, does any character looks like me, big and beefy, strong black guy, right? If it's too close, you can sue them. So, so you never know, right? But make sure you're gonna say you're gonna build your base, your Akira on 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 like uh, um, Tom Cruise. But you can start with Tom Cruise, but then you change your eyes and eyebrows and hair cut or whatever, and maybe a facial hair. Make sure it doesn't look like or, or talk like Tom Cruise, right? You're gonna make maybe say you wanna make a game just like Star Wars, and make a, but then don't have Darth Vader. Make something a bit different. <laughs> don't don't have Luke Skywalker, and make it a bit different. And make you can make it kind of similar. I mean, Star Wars, Star Trek, or whatever, right? And, and, and so I mean, some things are public domain, like Shakespeare. You can make a film or a game based on Shakespeare's material, but you cannot copy a film made by Kenneth Branagh twenty years ago, right? So you're gonna make sure be aware. And, and be 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 awake and and, and 
you just brainstorm with, with people who are experienced. So trademarks are, are a good question. Now, they need to be registered in each particular country to be most effective. What yeah. are the major territories that you feel video games need to be trademarked if, if someone can't go out and trademark it all across the world? I mean, what's the market for your game? If the basically for American market, US, right? In, in, in Europe, they make a joint uh, application for EU trademark protection. We start with one country first. And if you make game for maybe for Asian market, I would say maybe, maybe Japan might be a good thing. And so on. I mean, I, did, I mean, normally maybe I advise like, do do US, do Europe, and do maybe Japan. And we don't have to do maybe uh, somewhere like, like the Seychelles or whatever, right? Which leads us directly into our next question: How do you think China is able to get away with so many knockoffs and bootlegs? Because uh, uh, it's hard to sue Chinese parties and get go after them, and it's so kind of for them it's kind of a bit of a wild west. There's no structure for, for, for a little structure for, for video game protection and so on, right? And they have a history of not you know, honoring uh, Western uh, patents or trademarks or rights and so on. So I think the, the more China, China get more in, in, in involved in the Western world, the world trade and so on, it probably get changed, hopefully, to better. But, but for right now, you got to do your takedown notices when the Chinese game in, in copies your game and goes to Steam or Apple Apps or Google Play. You have to make a takedown notice. Do that. And it happens more, it happens too often to, to be good, but they hopefully get better. So Tom brings up a very good point that all of us who have been doing this for decades know contracts aren't important until something goes wrong. Then they're everything <laughs> absolutely worth their cost. <laughs> That's the thing to keep in mind, though. It's it's like you're not writing because I see this all the time too with with developers, and it's like well, it's me and my best friend. We're going to do this. We're not going to screw each other over. It's like you're not making the contract for right now. You're making the contract for two years down the road when the two of you hate each other and you don't know that yet, or something goes sideways. So it's um. They're, they're absolutely worth their worth the every penny. Um, so Tom also says, how do you protect yourself with an out of country contractor when you use them? They would you use something they did for you only to find out that they didn't own the rights and you have to sue them internationally? Well, you, you try to do you have your own law and, and home law and, and, and courts in your contracts. You gotta make sure you pay them on the offer they have delivered to you. I mean, Never pay them in advance. You can avoid it, right? And you, you have also have a process whereby you kind of examine their deliveries and make sure does this fly? Does it look good? Even though you have maybe a cheap contractor somewhere in in Eastern Europe or in Asia, it, it, they gotta claim that everything is kosher, everything is good, right? But you have yourself to check it out. Does this look good? I mean, it's a big story last year where a Swedish publisher. Did a contract with a, I think it was a, a, a contractor studio from from Cyprus, and, and they got the game and it's got a game well, up on Steam. And like but for two days, someone noticed that the one, one level was a total copy from Halo. The, the whole scene was a copy from a Halo Halo scene, right? And, and, and then I guess the, the, the publisher didn't investigate enough the deliveries. You should have looked at this. Does it look similar to, to Halo or whatever? Because uh, the, 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 the contractor just, yeah, you well, they thought, oh, this might be, look good. And so on. So you got to have a, have a, have a, have a process where you kind of, kind of, uh, investigate and control deliveries because every contract will say it's good, it's good, right? It's new, whatever. But sometimes they don't know or they make take chances. And so I only pay them up. I want accepted deliveries. That's, that's true too. And then, but then you find out like six months later that, the game that, that levels from Halo, but you don't remember Halo or you didn't play Halo. Mm -hmm. So what what is the average cost of legal expenses a game developer should expect? I mean, that's between the, the earth and the moon, right? Could be anything. I mean, it, it, it depends, depends on what game it is, a triple A, so it's a mobile game, who, who's the other party, who you, I mean, if you get sued yourself, if, if you copy Star Wars, you get sued by Disney, it could be a lot of money probably. And then you have a country claim your contractors will copy the copy infringed in, in, in Star Wars. I mean, 
and they go, maybe then you get, I mean, get attorneys abroad. I mean, I had a case here 20 years ago, which I inherited. Uh, the studio before I got in contact with them I had another attorney, and they had a, a publisher in Germany, and it was German law, German court for any conflicts. And of course, the, the publisher goes bankrupt, comes a bankruptcy state into it, and, and the bankruptcy state sues the developer, not German court. And you get a lawsuit in German. You get to translate it, understand it, write a, a, a reply, and that will be translated into German. I mean, it's uh, like a hundred thousand US the last like three weeks. That's gone mm -hmm. just for legal costs. I mean, so if you, yeah, that is if, if something really happens. I mean, then there is the protection, the the, the normal base that that you need to have to cover yourself, like like an insurance uh, uh, when nothing has happened. And, and that that is based on on an hourly rate, and that depends also a bit what your needs are. But we have decided to 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 give a, a special good price. If you if you have any needs for for or want to want to hire us or something, uh, just mention that you heard this uh, this uh, presentation, and we'll give you thirty percent off the price. So yeah. So so is there a and I see developers need this a lot. Is there a starter kit? If if you are just starting out, I mean, the articles of incorporation type stuff, contractor agreements, a default distribution agreement, that sort of stuff. If they need the paperwork in place to get things started on the right foot, is there a ballpark cost for, you know, doing something like that? Yeah. yeah, yes, absolutely. And then it depends on what country and what corporation and what contracts and so on. Because it also means in industry, what you can do yourself is we contract with your employees and your contracts and corporation and whatever. But if you're going to negotiate with a publisher, most likely the publisher will give you their draft contract. Yeah. And so on. So you got to read through that and, and, and review and redraft and, and negotiate, right? Mm. So I mean, if you're going to the few publishers will let you have your own contract, but also the same on the same token, if you're going to hire a contractor, use your own contract, not theirs. A lot of times, make sure you own the country want to want to own their IP and want to have their own home court and whatever, right? And some say we have no liability above a certain sum of money, whatever. We can't have that. We can't have anything as is or whatever. So we I mean, need to have your own contracts, and we do that. We have some kind of a to do some templates on where I can help us. <laughs> so uh, Mary says, I suspect this has already been tried, but what would happen if you tried to get both a Western copyright and a China copyright? Would that be a way to better protect yourself? I mean, yeah, it's, it's doable. But then again, I mean, to get a copyright in China might not be that easy. And what was it worth? I mean, if you have it in China, and you've got to sue somebody in China right, for infringement, and that's going to be a hassle. And so on. So, I mean, of course, the more uh, trademarks you have, the more patents you have, and the more uh, copyrights you have, the better off you are, of course. But but in many, but but it's still going to be an issue. You can show you you have better, better right, but you got only to 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 have better right, but also to get the better right, and so on. So, I mean, if if you have that, or sometimes if you have a publisher, can the publisher assist you to apply for trademarks and so on, right? And maybe maybe recoup it from game sales would be one thing. So, what is the the biggest negotiation mistake that you see new developers making in their contracts with publishers? First, not getting enough paid, not money for their work. Number two, giving the IP away too easily to the publisher or the third party, and and, and also uh, uh, committing to to too much work and to maybe having a kind of a Timeline for deliveries are not not um, possible, right? It's going to make it be, be be realistic. How much time do you need? How much money do you need? And can we keep the ownership of, of the IP, of the ownership of the property, or we need to give it away based on the who who funds the game and so on, right? But it's easy to sign away things you're not aware of. I mean, if you sign away your rights forever, maybe it becomes, it becomes a, maybe a franchise of games, and you only get paid for the first game. Can get a, a passive royalty, can you write to be the be the developer for a sequel, perhaps? And so on. So when developers are signing these contracts with 
with Sony and, and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple, and, and we've seen these things. They're, they're 50 pages long. They're absolutely ridiculous. And realistically, an indie dev can't negotiate any of it because, you know, Sony is going to go, I don't care what you think. This is going to be taking place in L.A. courts. Is there anything at all that they can do to further protect themselves other than you know, what's outlined in that contract that they pretty much have to sign whether they want to or not? I will say, without mentioning any names, any contract can be renegotiated and terms can be changed. A lot of times, don't be too afraid of the big publishers. I mean, I mean, one client called me the tank because I, I bulldoze over the opposition, even though there might be the big names and so on, right? But sometimes you have to, 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 to not be afraid and you protect your rights and and, and 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 believe in yourself, right? And I, I, so far in my 22 years, any every AAA contract we made, we've always been renegotiating, adding on, and deleting things with us. It can be done, right? You're to know what sections, what paragraphs can you change, and which can you not? But normally, you have a publisher in LA. It's going to be LA court and law. I mean, you can, in California law, you can't get away from that. But you can maybe get into other things, perhaps, right? And maybe you have maybe uh, some some better term for payment. Maybe maybe get uh, less penalties for late deliveries. Maybe you can have some other rights. Maybe keep some part of the IP, whatever. I mean, or, or so on. So be, maybe maybe 150 issues a contract. Maybe you can change 50. But the important thing is to realize that the worst they can do is say no. So you 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 can always at least attempt and push back. And whether or not they're going to accept it, that's a whole ton of different. Right? Also, one more issue here. I had a dinner once a long time ago with a good friend of mine who was a, a, an attorney for one of the top five pu publishers in the world. And he said, you know, Tommy, we have something called devil clauses. We add those in the contracts. You make sure, is the developer awake? Do they see these clauses are ridiculous? And do they strike them? Then they know what they're doing. <laughs> If not, the one the business studio has no idea what they're doing. That is more common than people realize. And I see it not only in contracts, but I've, I've gotten pitch decks from developers before. You get about nine slides in and there's a completely off the wall, does not match anything. And in some cases, highly inappropriate slide in there. And you're looking at the developer going, what in the hell was that? And they're like, I just wanted to make sure you read it. And I'm like, <laughs> fair enough. So yeah, I mean, if, if anyone has questions out here, out in the, yeah. Now for Tommy and Annette, let me know, drop it in chat and we can, we'll get it answered, you know, live. Uh, Tom actually just brought up a very, very good point. Watch out for words, words like net sales and expenses because they're not clearly defined. You can absolutely you know, lose a whole lot of money on there. Have you seen, are, are there standard definitions of, of net sales and, and what qualifies as expensive that you see? What kind of pitfalls should developers yeah. look out for there? Yes or no. I mean, how they could call Hollywood accounting. I mean, the students try to deduct everything, right? And so you got to make sure this detail is either by, 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 by industry practice or it's, agreed upon by the parties and so on. I mean, it happened to a client once where I had a small publisher in Canada and Toronto uh, for a small game and had a huge uh, marketing account. And that was the wife of the CEO of the publisher going to Vegas. She said, all, all, all right, all, all marketing. Yes. Or, or so they, they tried to you know, it's, it's, justify it's, a conference it's, across six different games. Yeah. Yeah, directly related, right? And make sure you, you read through that. A lot of times, read the contract from the back, push, start on the back, read forward. The, the, the immediate things, the important things in the back of the contract only. And that's where maybe the appendices regarding what's what's the net profits, what's the revenue share, and so on, right? Start there. So we are fortunate in the fact that in the last couple of years, we've had some publishers come out and say, look, here's our contract and, and they just drop it on the internet for, for anyone to see, you know, White Thorn did it recently, Raw Fury did it. What's your thoughts on that and, and how much 
a developer can take a contract that one publisher, you know, just publicly releases and apply that and learn from that for other publishers. Not to mention any names, but one of those names you mentioned, I did, I did, I've been negotiating against. And I'll say their contracts are probably the least favorite contracts for for publish, for developers and so on. So they're not, they're not really market terms at all. And they're very unfavorable for, for, for developers. You can learn from them, but everything is different, right? I mean, if you take one of those publishers' contracts and you go to Microsoft or EA or Square Enix, they won't care about that. They have problems with it. But you, you can read them if you haven't seen a publishing contract before. Read them and see what, what's, what's, what's good here, what's bad here. Is so anything good you can bring with us? We do our, get our own contract from our publisher. Can we renegotiate some things here? And so on. It, it's a really good way to at least understand the different aspects and the different sections in a contract and what should be in there and what shouldn't be in there. But yeah, you're right. That there's every contract, every publisher is going to have a different variation on the contract and something that a small indie publisher has is not going to look remotely like something one of the AAA publishers have. Um, question from CJ, why should I have a lawyer review a contract even when it's non-negotiable? There are always traps in contracts, right? Can I make sure, I mean, even for, for non-disclosure agreements regarding confidentiality, I mean, read that in detail. I think, what about how long is the confidential information protected? And so on. Uh, how far can it spread the information to affiliates and so on? Uh, 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 and so on. I mean, I'm doing, it's easy to think, oh, we're going to have NDA, you sign, it'll be good, right? But it's only protected for two years. Maybe you have some kind of, uh, 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 some kind of, um, kind of techn technology. Maybe you have a game engine. That may, may be valued, that value being protected more than two years, right? So read, but I think even though they say it's non negotiable, is it really? I mean, if it's send you in a contract in, in, in PDF, ask for a word copy. And then you change, you make, make a redraft, right? Because a lot of times it can be changed. Sometimes say, okay, we don't change, we made it with certain, we go, go, go beyond this sum for funding or beyond this court of law, this, this venue. But some things can be negotiated always. And, and if a publisher says nothing is negotiable, it's probably the wrong, wrong publisher. You want to work with someone who is that, had that attitude towards you. And CJ, the other aspect of that is sometimes you want a lawyer to act literally as a translator and explain sections to you that you may not be clear. It's like you can read it and say, okay, this is what it says but you may not understand what the actual ramifications of that is, you know, in a court of law. So if, if for nothing else to explain to you the sections and what they actually mean and how it's going to affect you, that that's a really good reason. Yeah, also one more thing is saying that, that you have to have an attorney, the attorney can be the bad guys against the publisher. You're, you're a good guy. So they deflect all uh, any anger from the publisher against the attorney. So you'd be a good guy. And it may, the, the publisher will take you more seriously when they get something back that's, you know, redlined from an attorney versus, you know, as the developer just looking at it and going, okay, this, this sounds fine and, and signing off on it. Uh, so Jack says, what do you think of CG Project Red's early release of Cyberpunk and knowing it wasn't what was promised? Well, I'm, I'm not, I don't play, I don't play that game, so I can't really talk about details, but if you, if you promise the player something, Maybe the length of time to play the game or certain features, and you don't have it. It's in theory breaking with your contract. I mean, as, as a player, you could probably say, "You want to want my money back yeah, if the game isn't isn't what's been promised, or, or, or so on." But then that's more a consumer law issue, really. So, I mean, a lot of times, if you do if you do as, as a publisher, you have handled consumers worldwide. I mean, what what's the time period for for for, for returning a game in, in Oregon or, or, or in Belgium or in Sweden, right? It depends, right? I mean, gonna make it as a pub as a publisher, if you do self-publishing, then make sure you have you know you you you, you have a method whereby people can get their money back and uh, so make sure don't promise what you'll deliver, right? Don't promise a twelve hour shooter is like a two hour whatever sandlot game, right? So Anthony asks, as a freelance game developer working on a contract basis, what are some common things to watch out for in temporary hiring temporary hiring contracts? As a contractor, make sure you get paid. So make sure you're entitled to payment. If they, if they terminate your contract, you get paid for for, for time work, right? And if, if you're a contractor, you make sure 
that you have kind of what your deliverables, uh, your deliverables are, are they known or they can they be estimated or can they on a whim just just reject your deliveries? What about payment? You get paid upon acceptance, and and what if you don't accept or 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 what if you hold back your payment for whatever reason? You work for three months and you don't pay anything. It's not good enough. So you make sure you're entitled to payment. And there's a process whereby you get paid often. And also your deliveries can be objectively measured. And make sure you get credit for your work, Anthony. Also, there's one thing also, you want to get credit in, in, in your portfolio or in the game itself, perhaps. You're going to maybe go in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain site, say your name is on this number of games. Depends what you're looking for, right? So Jack asked, what do you think the, the legal stance on fan games is with you know inspirations and homages and and remakes and basically fair use versus trademark infringement. Yeah, and fair use is a complex issue whereby if you're using someone else's copyright in a commercial product, it's probably not fair use, right? And so on. And also, don't do it. if you're successful, you're going to have a game that's going to be infringing someone else's copyright. And if you're unsuccessful. It's still going to infringe, right? I mean, you're going to have it as a portfolio. You're going to make money of it. What's your what's your what's your goal with that game? But normally, build from scratch. You have a license. I mean, make it to to, to Twilight or whatever, right? I mean, we build someone else's copyright. It's selling good, right? Few things you can probably show show up maybe a prospective employer or or, or or a publisher that you have certain skills. But I don't think anyone want to work with you with your incorporated in materials. Hmm. So, Tom asks, can a contractor stop the release of a product if they haven't been paid? Depends on the contract. So, I mean, it depends on what side I'm on, right? I mean, you know, if, you're on, <laughs> if you're on the developer side, you have a clause saying they cannot do it, right? And if you, on the contractor side, you make sure there's no such clause. So, again, it, it depends. Yeah. And, and like, when I went to law school in, the, in, in Washington State, it was in DC. My first class in, in American jurisprudence, that the professor said, attorneys are like gun, gunslingers in the Wild West. We work for whoever pays the most. So <laughs> whoever pay, pays me, I will give them advice, right? The other, other thing to keep in mind is just because someone else, and I, I had this with a client several years ago, they were working on a piece of technology and, and I looked at it and I went, is Apple okay with this? And they're like, yeah. A absolutely, we have no problems. It's been released in other games on the Apple Store, no, no, no issue at all. Well, the other games on the Apple Store had sold like twenty copies. I mean, there was it wasn't even on Apple's radar. The minute they were involved in something successful, though, Apple turned around and went, "Wait a minute, you're not supposed to be doing that." And and that's you know that little trap that a lot of developers can fall into. You assume that you can get away with it because someone else has done something similar in the past but the reality is the more successful your game is or your product the more of a magnifying glass that gets put on it by lawyers all over the um all over the world um, da, 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 da. i think that's it that's all of our questions annette tommy thank you so much for coming and, and hanging out with us on your your thursday afternoon our thursday morning um, are you are, are you all on the Discord or are, are you going to be around later? Yeah, we'll, we'll be around. We're not on Discord so much, but we we are around mail wise. You can always get into our website lawyer.st and you see our mail addresses and you can write to us and excellent. Yeah. And that's an easy website to remember. So lawyer.st. There yeah. you go. And even easier, I'm a lawyer at Lloyd Odessi. She's president at Lloyd Odessi. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, give us about five minutes, and then we will be back next with Amber Johnson talking about uh, your first photogrammetry studio. And I actually think I pronounced that word right for the first time. So <laughs> thanks, everybody. We'll talk Thank to you, you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.